So we'll have all the presenters come up. There are seven chairs if we pull the chair out of the corner. Go ahead and have a seat. <coughs> and we'll just open this up for questions. So I guess this is for the clinical audiologist. Um, you know, I, I think we all agree that making decisions about fitting amplification and assistive technology is challenging for kids with unilateral loss. What's the most useful information that you can get from EI providers, classroom teachers, school-based professionals, knowing that we're most often not with the families during their appointments with you? If we are doing a trial with amplification, it would be really nice to get input from teachers as well as parents about what they noticed when the child was wearing the device or how often they were wearing the device. If you noticed any improvements in their ability to localize sound or in their speech and language abilities. Um, sometimes parents will have an, an inventory or maybe you, you might provide them with an inventory to kind of go through pre and post hearing aid use. That's, that's pretty useful information to us and can help us make uh, good decisions. If they're not wearing a device too, just to um, let us know how are they doing overall, because I know you guys will track a lot of different progresses, so how are they doing developmentally? How do you think their speech and language, is it on track? Any of that information might drive further recommendations from us, especially if they're not wearing a device at the time. And I, I also think there's one aspect that, especially in early intervention, that you all get to see that we don't, and that's the natural environment and what the families capabilities are to um, to be consistent good communicators to help keep a device on we don't always see that clinically mm -hmm. we don't know what happens outside of our you know of our sound booth um, and there are some families that talk a really good game when they're in the office with us who have no follow-through at home and sometimes that perspective is really super useful <laughs> I wonder if you have any plans to uh, increase the number in your informal study that you talked about, Nicole? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of did this for the purpose of the talk and just rounded up all the audiologists to help me collect data for a couple months, but but after looking at it, we are definitely interested in, in expanding this and being even uh, more rigorous and getting more information from kids about what their, what benefits them day to day. So yes, Eileen, we are. <laughs> and, then, and then one more question, I hope you don't mind, is on, I think everyone agrees that there's a, an unknown to fitting amplification at an early age for kids with unilateral hearing loss, but with newborn hearing screening and finding these unilateral hearing loss, is there gonna be some more, maybe, a, um, maybe earlier fitting trials so that you can kind of look at how these kids are doing if they wear them from an early age. I mean, I know we have a couple students in our district who were fit early on, mm -hmm. and they don't, I, I think that, that it's maybe more for safety for them, but they're wearing them mm -hmm. and using them, and, and that's a good sign. We do have conversations with parents at the time of diagnosis and you know, whether we end up choosing like a watch and wait and watch, watch and see, or a confirm with behavioral testing, or we're recommending a hearing aid at three months of age. It's, it's, it is, it is variable um, and, and highly dependent on how motivated the family is um, and, and what we're, what type of hearing loss we're working with on the child. So, um, we would love there to be like a standard path that we could recommend for each child based on how they present in clinic, but it's just not the way that it, that it ends up being. Yeah, and I wonder if as time goes by, there will be more information learned about it, but I, mm -hmm. I hate to say it though, I bet part of it is financial. And mm -hmm. you know, if, if the family has the right insurance that's gonna pay for it, they're maybe gonna be able to get it more so although I know children's has really has some great programs yeah so maybe not I say we at least here we have the luxury of not letting that financial barrier yeah. impact our plan of care yeah, that's we think true. it's the appropriate plan of care yeah. so I I do have a comment and so it's easy for me to say because I'm not seeing patients anymore in the clinic so take that with a grain of salt <laughs> but I think there's a many reasons why you might not 
you know, why audiologists might be hesitant to fit amplification early in a child with unilateral hearing loss. But I, I really think the idea that the ABR is not enough to do that is no more valid for a child with unilateral hearing loss than it is for a child mm -hmm. with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And we wouldn't do that anymore. We know mm -hmm. that the ABR is highly correlated with later results and that we monitor progress and we change if needed. So if that's your limitation for fitting a hearing aid on a child with unilateral hearing loss, I don't, um, I don't see the evidence that that's a great argument. There are other ones, there are other reasons I think that, that are compelling, but the ABR data um, seem to make a very good first fit for a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Does anybody? I agree. Yeah. I would agree, and I think what you don't know about ABR with the greater degrees of hearing loss is the, what their speech understanding is, mm -hmm. and so that's where you, you know you can estimate a sure. pure tone threshold, but you don't know yeah. if you have a severe hearing loss what that child's speech understanding is on that side when they're a baby. Yeah, but you don't for bilateral either. No, yeah. but you know they have no access to sound. Yep, mm -hmm. fair enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a comment. It's on. It's on. It's what? On. It's on. I, I don't fit hearing aids in a long time, um, a very long time. But I do do cochlear implants, and I'm excited about data logging on all of the modern devices because it really, I think we'll get a lot of information about how devices are actually used. And the number of times, even for kids with bilateral profound hearing loss, uh, with, who go through the trouble of getting surgery and cochlear implants for uh, babies, and you look at, and they say, oh, they wear it all the time. And, and you look at the data logging, and their average use is three hours per day. Um, the reality of keeping devices on babies, particularly those that are not even sitting or uh, running around, is really, it's really hard. And there are parents who are highly, you know, all they have to do is, is you know, chase their kid around and keep putting <laughs> their device is back on, but the reality of most parents is they don't have that leisure. Um, and I've certainly heard parents say, well, you know, what do you do when you're breastfeeding? What do you do? I mean, we all think in theory it's great to get these devices on really early, um, but devices have gotten much friendlier, baby friendly, um, but we're not quite there yet. And so I think for <coughs> early intervention providers in working with the families, working with us, how do we, how do, we do this and what's the reality of a family um, in terms of keeping devices on? If I could just add to that comment is that um, unlike children with bilateral profound who have no sound, Children with unilateral hearing loss still do have one normal hear, hearing ear. And so it's not like they're not getting any um, acoustic input. So I think just like kids with um, amblyopia, so they have asymmetric input to their eyes, there's, you know, it's not like the critical, uh, the period for developmental vision shuts down right at three years um, if you don't have any input. It's, it's wider. It's still not. 10, 11 years, it's more, I think, five or six years. But still, it doesn't shut down. So I think there's probably something we can gain from that, from the hearing aspect as well, is that critical window, pro the critical period for binaural process is probably wider. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, um, on, the, on the one hand, I appreciate all the efforts to try to fit hearing aids in infants. I also appreciate this, the, the struggles that parents go through. And you know, especially when they're toddlers and they're constantly pulling it off and they're chasing them around, trying to keep them from bumping their heads. It's just, it's a lot. And I've, I've hear it over and over again from parents of how stressful it is. And that their audiologist really wants them to keep hearing it on the ear, but it is really difficult to do so. So I think um, it's, it's important to have that relationship with the parents and to be um, team members with them, but not to make them feel bad because they can't keep that hearing aid on the small child. I also think that there's value in um, a comment that was raised during my talk is, is that providing all the options available and maybe mm -hmm. that's not just <coughs> amplification but also services like CART or um, just some 
captioning, listening strategies, and maybe someday we'll have some kind of auditory training that is really effective for these children, but I don't think we know yet, but I think it's important to, to partner with the family and, and give those options um, and not and maybe not just be amplification like you're saying. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll kind of add just really briefly that I think studies looking at, um, as Dr. Norton mentioned, data logging, for example, for children with unilateral loss that wear a hearing aid, and how does that correlate with outcomes? Those are really valuable. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, for those of you, um, there's a interested in children with more mild and moderate bilateral degrees of hearing loss, there's a really fantastic edition devoted entirely to outcomes for those children by the Boys Town, Iowa, North Carolina group. And one of the things that I think is really compelling is that the amount of time a day that a child with mild to moderate bilateral hearing loss wears a hearing aid is predictive. And that's the first kind of real solid data. And so I think that that might help audiologists make the case. But of course, having had two young children that don't have hearing loss, you know, hats off to those of you who can keep a hearing aid on for an hour. Right. Um, I mean, I get that it's really hard, but I do think Part of the issue too with children with unilateral hearing loss is providing the evidence that it matters and um, mm -hmm. we just don't have the studies yet so mm -hmm. you know support basic and applied research is my <laughs> message <laughs> teen's story is unique as all of you have said every child's different and dr c and nicole uh, allowed her to have a trial, 14 years old. And the trial, she had two, as a matter of fact. The first day that it was on, she was happy, she was talking, and she was feeling good about who she is. She does very well in school, and that is unique, but socially, we haven't made it yet. And being able to hear. I'm the only one that knows she can't hear. The teachers think, well, she's great, she's great. Oh, we do have a, we do have a audiologist at school that's wonderful too. Uh, and she's here today and she's helpful, very helpful for Tian. In fact, she got her a friend today. <laughs> Tian, everybody should love her because she's that way, but they don't know her because she doesn't come out without the implant. So whatever you're doing, do it for the kid that liked him. She didn't even talk till she was 14, not really 13. Well, not, I lied, 10 when she came here. I taught her. I taught her very slowly and very quickly. And she went from 10, started at one years old, uh, training her at one year old type of training. But she was 10 when she came here from China. And by the time she was 12, she was at seventh grade level. Mm -hmm. Passed all the tests. Mm -hmm. So she's on her way, but you know, socially it's a good thing too. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen. And she doesn't hear at school when it's testing. And the 504 is working. However, no one mentioned the fact that uh, I, had, I contacted the college board testing and they gave her time and a half or double time to take the tests. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing because, yeah. you know, she just learned to read, but she reads well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. um, so for the last speaker, I'm apologizing because I don't remember your name, but the study you just shared with us. Are you, is that something that we can share with our students as well? Because for the kids who are alone in schools, and who we haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to because they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really, really powerful. Yeah. Sure, uh, you're welcome to um, you know, share these, these quotes. They're relatively anonymous, so that's fine. And um, you know, this research is, this is, these are kind of preliminary results still. So um, I, I put a flyer actually out on the table, and if there's any, any families who would be interested in participating in this study, it's still ongoing, and we'd still like to interview you know, more youths and um, their parents. So yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
are you thinking uh, geographically diverse? I mean, we're from California. Would you be interested in interviewing some of our students? I don't know, via Skype or whatever. Or <laughs> so our, our current, I mean, I would love to. Our current IRB um, doesn't include, so we're doing phone <coughs> surveys that I could do with someone in California. Mm -hmm. The uh, longer interviews are, for our IRB have to be in person to achieve to get a written consent form, um, but the, I can do a verbal consent form over the phone for a shorter survey. So that would be great. You know. Okay, um, and then my other the real question was probably directed at the two of you. Um, is there any um, research regarding plasticity of the brain to uh, adjust to amplification by um, in two ways? One, uh, the intermittent use of amplification versus consistent use of it, and, and then the second is by age. Is there like a, a threshold at which um, the plasticity degrades? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> So is there plasticity? Definitely. Um, we know that actually in the, in, in the adult literature as well, um, that um, uh, patients who have gone through surgery and lost their hearing and then have the cochlear implants, there is some plasticity that, well, there has to be some plasticity. They regain hearing. Um, and is there data regarding intermittent usage? No. <laughs> um, we don't know about intermittent usage. and. Um, even with long-term usage, do we know? Again, it's right now it's all, part of the difficulty is like, for instance, with, with single-sided deafness, if once you put an implant in, you can't image them anymore um, in an MRI because you have then this bloom uh, because of the implant. And so um, they can't be um, candidates for it. So it's really hard to do that. There are other technologies that are being developed to look at kids um, and their changes in um, uh, neuroplasticity. So, their um, EEG um, type monitoring that's very um, time intensive and data intensive that's being done, for instance, in, in Toronto. Um, at, um, at our institution, people are working on um, uh, dif um, optical tomography, so where they use light um, in order to gain information. Um, that's still in working, in, it's in progress. Um, so hopefully in the future, there will be technologies that will allow us to look at changes over time, especially with these interventions where there are implants and things, we're not there yet. Um, but I, it, so it's, 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 it's a very interesting question and, um, and we have to assume that there is some plasticity, that you know, the, what kids can do with implants and with um, these bone conduction aids <laughs> is really pretty amazing. Um, but we can't see it directly yet. And with respect to the question about amplification, I think, again, I, I feel like I just keep saying we, we don't know. Um, <coughs> but we don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, now we certainly, you know, I think Nicole raised sort of the problem is, so when you do the watch and, and wait approach, um, one of the things that you're potentially doing, depending again on the degree of loss, is not stimulating the cochlean auditory nerve, but also, as Dr. Liu points out, in the case of unilateral hearing loss in, in one ear, not the other, um, the child typically um, develops speech and language, and, and there's um, crossover in the system. And so how that impacts, and, and you know, for example, if you waited until age seven to fit a hearing aid, have you lost really critical time, or can you make it up? So I think those are really critical questions, and I'm not sure we know. We, we do know from animal studies that the system's plastic, even in adults, and but the extent to which it can be manipulated, and um, we know a lot more about bilateral hearing loss, of course, and, and the effects of waiting in that system than we do with unilateral. I mean, and there is some information from mm -hmm. um, studies where um, people have been tested um, before and after um, an oral atresia repair, yeah. for instance. Yeah. And so there is evidence that up to, it's not clear, somewhere probably between 7 and 11 years of age that critical period closes, but we don't know exactly mm -hmm. when that is, um, when you are not able to then use binaural processing as well. But again, that's, there was a really small numbers of kids. The problem even with those patients is that their repaired ear didn't come up to normal. Um, and so we don't know yet. <coughs> I think I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, the panel because my attempts to find out from like the Hemonk community, I think we get lost in follow-up. But I was wondering if any of you know, either anecdotally or otherwise, 
of any sort of correlation between unilateral hearing loss and kidney cancer, whether it's neuroblastoma or Wilms tumors. <laughs> Because I think as a member or um, parent of a member of the Hemont community, once you get done with appointments, you don't want to go back there <laughs> where you've been for every week for the last however many months. Um, so for like example, in Fred Hutch, there's a long-term Wilm study that's been going on for all. They haven't, that's not an endpoint they've tracked. Have you guys noticed anything or is that something we wait for the nationwide kid database and see what pops up? Thanks. So yeah, I don't. I don't know if, if, if you, Dr. C has any information. I don't know. I mean, we do have a long-term survivorship, survivorship uh, study that's going on at Children's. Um, and so I'm actually part of the group that tracks the ototoxicity um, of that. Um, I don't, I, I'm not aware. Yeah, so I don't believe this was not an ototoxic regimen. In our case, it was a uh, vincristine and not just this black. So. Well, you know, vincristine is potentially um, neurotoxic, right? And so I, yeah. yeah. Right. Too bad Henry's not here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but um, Henry <coughs> is one of my partners who, uh, who studies ototoxicity in zebrafish. And one of the issues with these chemotherapeutic regimens is that they often have multiple agents. And even though we think we have a pretty good understanding of which agents are ototoxic, we have less understanding of the potential interactions of these different agents. Um, but the treatment for Wilms is not one that's typically high on our list as far as ototoxic effects. Um, there are some interesting fluky things like kids who have um, LP have um, shunts are at risk for unilateral hearing loss, ipsilateral to the side of the hearing loss. I could never understand that. Um, <coughs> but at any rate, I, I had a comment about um, the potential benefit for amplification for these kids with amplification or assistive listening devices for these kids with unilateral hearing loss. You know, one is the sound localization and all the central processing that goes on with that. But it seems to me like a lot of the teenagers in particular um, really appreciate having the sound awareness. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, a simple kind <coughs> of mechanical, they want to know when someone on that side is talking to them. Um, is that enough to, to justify I think I think it really does depend on kind of what Patricia finds out, but also, <laughs> if, like if you, if on a quality of life um, survey, that is an issue where they feel like their um, their social abilities are hampered by their hearing loss, then I think it's very it's worth trying, even if it's just sound awareness, because one of the most frequent complaints that I hear is that. Um, if someone t t talks to me on my bad ear side, I can't hear them and I don't pay attention to them and they think that I'm being rude and not, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, not interacting. Yeah. And that leads to a lot of avoidance of new situations. Um, and for especially a teenager, you know, heading off hopefully to college and, and to other opportunities, that can be something that really does hamper them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, that may be enough, but obviously they're old enough to help you make that decision. Driving force for my daughter to who used the FM system in second through fourth grade and then said, I'm awkward, we're changing classrooms, I don't want to wear this. I get good grades, Dr. C, can I not wear this? <laughs> she agreed, straight A's, you're good to go. Sophomore in high school, round tables in the cafeteria, socially awkward, embarrassed, riddled a little bit, cross system, she's in. It's all that's excellent. I mean, so I think it's time and exposure and yeah. development. That's, that's one thing we do for these kids is that we recognize that just because they make a certain decision at one point in their lives mm -hmm. doesn't mean that's a decision for the rest of their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. And so some of the kids kind of look at me like this again. They want to talk to me about amplification again. But I, you know, I only see them once a year or every couple of years. And um, I try to be consistent about saying, hey, you know, I know you did it before and I know you didn't like it, but things change, right? Mm -hmm. These kids, they're listening. Um, demands really change over their lifetime and uh, and then they it's so cool when they get to be preteens and teenagers because <clears throat> they recognize it and they might it's remarkable to me how often I'll introduce that concept in clinic and the parents are like there's no way he's gonna wear a hearing aid and the, the kids nodding yeah I want to yeah. try it yeah. um, so I was gonna know. say I have a, a patient of mine who has mixed hearing loss and um, 
and because she's, she has cluster, recurrent clustiotoma, recurrent infection, so she can't often wear her hearing aid. And so <laughs> it's, it's very distressing to her that she can't wear her hearing aid. Um, so we've, we've brought up the possibility of Baja. She, she's not interested it yet, yet, but I've got the feeling she may get there um, because, you know, even with um, uh, not, because she can't wear it, it, she, it does affect her social life at school. And I think in Arkansas, they have a larger group of kids who have tried Bajas. And again, they don't have any sound localization, but it seems like um, having that sound awareness may be enough. Um, and it's kind of one of those disruptive technologies where it's not great, it's not perfect, it's not what we want it to be, but it may be enough. Maybe that's better. Okay, um, so I have one more question, and it's related to devices. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering. I've been. I wrote a grant last year for to get some of these um, live scribe note taking devices that uh, record a lecture that a student is listening to, and the, they take notes in a special notebook, and now, then they can later on go back and touch that space in the notebook and hear a recording of what was said at that time in during the lecture. Um, and the issue that we're running, and I got it, I only got like two devices because I was afraid of the audio quality for, that was um, created for these devices. And that's the problem, is that they're the, um, the kids love them, the kids that I've had used them with, um, and they're unilateral kids, but the audio quality is not that great. Have you heard of anything out there that is combining this amazing technology with um, with better audio quality. Anybody? No, but I, that's really cool. I didn't yeah. know. It's, yeah. Oh, it's, really they're cool. they're but awesome. Yeah. But you can. You know. It's a pen. Yeah. It's, it's an actual pen and and, and a special notebook yeah. that you they, take your notes in. So. You know, technologically, you should. You know, you could think of a way to modify that where you just have direct in audio input from the teacher to the pen. So that would be they, like a Roger technology mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, some but sort it could like go that. directly. Yeah. So the issue is probably you're picking up a lot of noise with the pen too. Right. But that seems like a, like, I mean, I think I could benefit from that technology. But I, it's but, great. Yeah. But for a child with, um, who may have missed part of the message, but um, certainly the technology is there to, it just hasn't maybe been developed. But those are the kinds of things where, you know, there are some NIH level grants that are designed to do business partnerships with research, and those are the kinds of ideas that people probably get pretty excited about. And um, yeah, I've often thought about, um, you know, we talk so heavily, at least in our work, on auditory cues, but we know visual information is so critical um, to these environments too that maybe providing access um, at a desk level or something to the teacher's face would be really valuable to some children too. And so I think that. The cool thing is technology is is just advancing really quickly. But yeah, I love that idea. I uh, was at a session recently, and it was for teaching, but at the college level. And I know that a lot of school, elementary, middle schools, high schools are using a lot of technology now. And so I'm not sure if this would apply. But there are there are some um, things that you can use where if you have a lecture like a PowerPoint like this and you're teaching, you can record your voice and it is synced to the slide progression and you're using um, things to, you know, you're circling things on the board and things like that. And I'm not sure if that would be helpful at all, but I'm thinking something like that. I, and I can't remember what that um, system was called. I could look it up though. Thank you. Does somebody know? Ours is called Panopto. Panopto? Panopto? Yeah. Panopto. P-E-N? P-E-N-O-P-T-O. Okay. And then okay. there's also Tegrity. Tegrity. Or two that UW uses quite frequently. <laughs> 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 the first one has. The first one was. Panopto. Um, and the second one is Tegrity. Um, I th Tegrity was phased out of UW, so I don't know if it's not as good of a system as Panopto, but. Um, we all require it in our lectures. Or better. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, like we, we all utilize it, so it's really useful. Well, I would like to close the session. I would like to thank our incredible panel of presenters. You guys, it, it was incredible how well your talks meshed together and just kind of um, uh, really gave us a lot of basic information, theoretical information, useful information. 
Um, we know, I think, what our questions are, and sometimes that's half the battle, is understanding what the questions are. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for attending, and uh, have a, a good rest of the year. We will see you back next year. Don't forget to turn in your evaluations. Thank you.